Dear young adults, Om Sairam and welcome to the April workshop for the Satya Sai Young Adult Talent Development Program 2018. Before we kickstart today's workshop, let us pray to our beloved Bhagavan for his blessings to ensure that this session runs smoothly. Om Dear Bhagavan, we pray to you to seek your guidance and to deepen our understanding and broaden our thinking. Swami, with your divine blessings, may the skills that we develop from this workshop be used to aid us all in our daily lives. Today's session will be facilitated by Sister Roshni Vusvanathan from Malaysia. Sister Roshni was blessed to discover her beloved Swami through the SSE classes, run close to her home. Since then, Swami has been her best friend, confidant, and basically her go-to person for everything. This relationship with our Lord has got her through many obstacles in this game of life and helps her to see everything as a blessing. See now, SSE had changed her life. She was inspired to be a SSE teacher from a young age. She then went on to hold regional and national leadership positions in the Malaysian Educare Academy specifically in areas of teen youth development. In 2017, Roshni was immensely blessed by Swami to take on the role of Deputy International Young Adult Coordinator together with a team of Zone Young Adult Coordinators and Sub-Committee Leads. Professionally, Rosh Sister Roshni runs an HR consultancy firm back in Malaysia, allowing her to wield Swami's teachings and train it into a con training and consultancy and benefit the co corporate world. Sister Roshni, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Brother Donovan, for that wonderful introduction. Brothers and sisters, Om Shri Sai Ram. Welcome to this month's Young Adult Talent Development Program and I am extremely excited to join this session as well as to explore this topic together with all of you. But before we begin, let us invite Swami to join us so that we could also uh, enjoy Swami's presence as well. Let us all close our eyes. And take three deep breaths. Now imagine as you are sitting on your chair and looking at your screen, you smell a wonderful fragrance coming into the room. And as you turn around, you see Swami at the door, walking slowly towards you. And slowly, as he walks, you observe his hair, his beautiful face, his wonderful orange robe. And as Swami comes towards you, you pull up a chair and invite him to sit right next to you. And you look at Swami and we ask him, Dear Swami, remind us that as we go through this program, it is you that is speaking and that it is you who is listening.
You can slowly open your eyes. Sairam again, everyone. Now, before we begin today's session, I've got a few questions for all of you. Yeah. Um, my first question to you guys is, um, how many of you have ever facilitated a session before? How many of you have facilitated a session before? Can you please just put those answers in the chat box? Yeah. So I just need to know how what, what kind of experience the group says, the group has, and then we can move on from there. Yep, Abina says she's done a few study circles. Anyone else? It could be anything. You could have facilitated a study circle, yeah, a session uh, in your center, in your state. Yeah, thank you, guys. Yeah, Divya says I've done a few. I have, I have. Prakriti says I have. Nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Sai Gilda says, I've had, uh, done a few study circles and awareness classes. Yakshi says, I did one last Sunday. Great. All right. So we have a group of people who um, have actually done facilitation before. And so as I go on in the session, please feel free to add. Uh, please feel free to add to whatever you feel that is lacking. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this is a facilitation session and therefore it is something that needs to be highly interactive. Yep, so uh, the next thing I want to ask you guys is agreement to constantly interact throughout the session. Yep, so it's extremely important that I have feedback from everybody. So I need a quick agreement from everyone and say yes if you agree in the chat box that you will not be a spectator today, but you will participate in all discussions. So if you agree to this, I want you to put it in the chat box. Yep, let's go. Thanks, Anish. Here we go, Divya. Right. It, that's amazing. Great. So I want to see everyone's name appear. So let's do this really quickly. All right. Awesome. So I can see everybody agreeing. So I am looking forward to a really interesting session. And it's key for us to remember that in facilitation, uh, there's definitely not one way. And also, we are learning from each other. So remember that everything you say, you say and everything you contribute is going to contribute to the ultimate learning of all of us together today. Yep. So if you have any questions, any queries, please post them in the chat box. I'm also going to try and finish on time so that we have some time at the end for us to address questions that you still have. So these are the areas that we will be covering today, as you can see them outlined in the slide. First thing we're going to explore is what is facilitation? We're going to kind of try and define that. Secondly, we're going to look at uh, what are the key ingredients to becoming a good facilitator? what really makes a good facilitator. We then are going to experience a live session that I will conduct today. I want you to be very observant of everything that is happening today uh, right from the start, yeah? Because that will be useful as we approach the end of the program. We're going to look at how to use Swami's five teaching techniques. I see some of the SSE teachers on the group today, so you guys will be experts in this. So we're going to look at how to use Swami's five teaching techniques in terms of running a session and facilitating knowledge. We then will look at effective questioning skills, how do we develop questions. We will then further go on to looking at uh, other facilitation tools that are currently used uh, in the market and that we can also uh, leverage on. Then we will look at Facilitating for different group sizes. So the way that we facilitate for larger groups, I know some of you do sessions on the national and also international level where, you know, like for example, in World Youth Festival, we had groups of um, close to 2,000 to 3,000 people. So facilitating for 3,000 people and facilitating for a group of two people is very different. So how do we manage that? Uh, finally, and this one I think is very important to our lives today, facilitating sessions online, how that is different and how we can adjust 
uh, towards a session that is facilitated online. And finally, we will end with uh, a few question and answers. Now, it looks like a lot for us to cover, so let's jump right into it. Yeah. So the first thing that, uh, that we want to cover is, what is facilitation? So I want you to give me a very honest answer. Type your answers in the chat box and no Googling the answer, please. So what is your opinion and what do you think facilitation is? So Brandon says uh, sharing ideas and thoughts. Sai Lakshmi says makes it easier carry out to carry out a simple process. Yeah. Okay, now the chats are flowing in. So give me a second so I can kind of read all of them out to you. Um, Anish says hosting with a main uh, with the aim of extracting ideas, information, and personal thoughts. Prakriti says helping to deliver something in a manner that everyone can understand. Uh, Raksha says to transmit, share, and ease the understanding of something. Very nice. Divya says, encouraging and providing direction for people to share their views on the topic. Uh, Shitran says, someone who gets people to do stuff to make some difference in some way. Minakshi says, to ease the session, uh, to help people to understand points easily, uh, act of helping others to understand stuff. Kavita says, to provide information and make people feel comfortable in the session. Amla says coordinating and mediating different perspectives. Anjana says sharing and guiding people. Sagir there says facilitation is to create a necessary ambience to bring out that which is latent in an individual uh, or the participants. Uh, Irina says connecting panelists, uh, motivate, leading, and directing, uh, giving or guiding someone, says uh, Prema. Uh, amazing, everyone. You, you guys are really framing up what facilitation really is. Umesh says to connect the participants to achieve their desired results. Now, all of you are absolutely right. Uh, these are all various aspects to what facilitation is. Yeah, so thank you so much for your responses. Um, and let's look at the actual definition of facilitation. So if you look here, to actually facilitate, it's a very simple thing. It's basically to make easy or to enable something or someone. So for example, um, an old lady is trying to cross the street. How can that be facilitated? It could be you holding her hand and helping her to cross the street. Um, it doesn't even have to be you. It could be a traffic light that she... <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Uh, it could be a traffic light that she presses the button and that traffic light enables her to cross the street. Uh, it could be a police officer helping her to stop traffic so that she could cross the street. So that act of enabling or to make easy something is what we call facilitation. Now, in the context of learning, however, facilitation is providing a change and development in an individual feeling, thinking, and behavior from having participated in some sort of experience. So look at the words that I've highlighted, and these are the words that are critical to the sentence. Yeah? So we're trying to provide some sort of change, some sort of development, and the word feeling, thinking, and behavior is what is really key here. So, you know, Swami always talks about in head, hands, and heart. So it needs to address all three areas. And another thing that we want to highlight is also the word experience. So when learning is experienced uh, using most of our senses, that is a feeling that remains with us. And one thing I, one thing I like to think about is, uh, I like to go back to the time that I'm in school and think about stuff that I remember that I learned when I was in school. So after so many years of leaving school, you tend to look back and notice that the things that you really remember are things that uh, you apply in today's life or where the teacher had really done something, you know, an activity, a song or something that you experienced that touched you at that point. 
And these are the stuff that you tend to remember. So having gone through some sort of experience is what, you know, uh, helps us retain the knowledge that we have received. So in the context of learning, that is really what facilitation is. Now, what does Swami have to say about this? Swami says that the edu education that originates from within has a sound basis and it is permanent. It is referred to as satim. The word educare means to bring out that which is within. Human values are latent in every human being. One cannot acquire them from outside. They have to be elicited from within. Educare means to bring out human values. To bring out actually means to translate them into action. So if you look at the second, um, the second quotation that we've taken from Zakir Sai speak, now this is really the premise that we are going to work on when we are talking about the theory of facilitation within the Sai organization or within this environment. So with the firm belief that all values are already latent within a person, all knowledge that needs to be acquired is already latent within a person, the job of the facilitator is merely to show that knowledge, to put up a mirror in front of the participants, and show them that these are things that are already within them. So that is really what facilitation is all about. Now, having this in mind, what do you think a good facilitator, I'm going to move the slide, one slide back, yeah, because I want you to think about it. Could you tell me what are the ingredients of a good facilitator? What, do you, what kind of qualities? Yeah, you can type it. Thank you, Shay. Um, type it out. What do you think a good facilitator, what kind of qualities do they need to have? So if everybody could put your thoughts down. Yeah, you just put one that you, that you think is critically important. Yeah, Brandon says you need to be an exemplary person. And uh, you need good listening skills. Thank you, Irina. Raksha says you need to be very empathetic as a listener. Aditya says, uh, communications, confidence in communication, great communication skills. Yeah, good listeners coming out quite a bit. And yes, that is a very, very critical skill. Kavita says, to be knowledgeable. Yep, that's important. Shia says, to be a great listener and lateral thinker. Sailakshmi says, experience a clear mind and insight. Yes. Acknowledge all views coming in, says Divya, correct. Vaishnavi says uh, you need to be a motivator. Vaishnavi, you need to change your settings to um, everyone in the chat box because you're messaging me privately and everyone else can't see it. Uh, Sai Girdar says joyful, open-minded, and non-judgmental. Uh, Amla says to be open, not non-judgmental. Uh, Kavita says patience. Communication is key, says Anastasia. Sarisha says good communication skills. Anish says, a friendly and welcoming person who encourages others to speak out. Uh, Prema says, confidence, good communication, and have good experiences. Yep. Raksha says, loving and effective communication. Anjana says, exemplary person, good listener, non judgmental. Dipesh says, you need to involve everybody. Indu says, be open minded and good communication. Shalu says, do your homework well on the topic to be covered. Thank you, Shalu. That's great. Thank you, everyone. Any, any other thoughts coming in? I can see some of you are still not sharing. Please do try and share, yeah, if you, if you already have it. All right. Okay. Now, I am going to move on uh, and tell you a little thoughts that I've had um, that I think would make a good facilitator as well. So here's, here's my thoughts. So, uh, firstly, a facilitator needs to be enthusiastic and passionate. I think we've got that covered. I see that in, your, in the chat box as well. Um, of course, if you are not enthusiastic and passionate, nobody is going to be enthusiastic about uh, the stuff that you're presenting. So, I think you really need to have a buy-in and you need to have a strong belief in what you're presenting. It's very difficult to fake it. And you, of course, you shouldn't. It's very difficult to fake it when you're presenting something and you yourself do not believe in it. 
and of course that is not um, that is not right as well yeah so once you believe in something and once you you really have a buy in to the topic or the subject and you've already practiced it you do not have to fake enthusiasm because it would come naturally because of your belief in the subject now second thing is to involve the learners and this is my all time favorite to be patient uh, these were this was one of the greatest lessons when i started facilitating sessions um it really teaches you to have patience because if you want to involve the learners sometimes you come across groups that don't feel comfortable sharing a lot in the beginning and you tend to as a facilitator and this is just my experience it it kind of made me feel very insecure that no one was sharing and then i started to feel insecure uh, this would make me talk more and this would make me kind of turn the entire facilitation session into a very lecture base where i ended up being the person who spoke the most so involve the learners and if they are not starting to share then we need to figure out a way in how we can make them open up yeah and this involves a lot of patience now the third thing is learn by experience lead by example whenever you are sharing something that you've had experience in that makes the session incredibly powerful because you're not faking it you know so when you have some personal experience to share that touches the people you're presenting to and it increases your credibility tenfold so something that is very critical uh, almost like what shalu says that homework on the topic you need to do it and if you do not have that experience you need to bank on someone else's experience at least so that you can share that yeah so that's one thing that we need to remember provide practice and feedback so when you are conducting a live session uh it is always important to be extremely observant of your participants and it is very good to give feedback to people directly when it is uh when it is possible and also to give feedback to the group and so that's also very critical in in your facilitating a session be positive and supportive yeah uh, allow debate and challenge of ideas now this is what really makes a session real when you allow for debate to take place and you allow for challenge of ideas to take place now if you constantly feel that we are the only person in the room that has the highest knowledge you as a facilitator also miss out you miss out the opportunity to learn from your participants plus that feeling of insecurity will always exist because you can never be sure that you are the smartest person about the topic in the room but when you are completely open for challenge of ideas and you're completely open to learning as a group and developing together then you you will not feel that insecurity and when someone challenges the idea we look at it as a group to learn together and overcome the problem so again this works on our mentality as a facilitator and it works on our confidence levels as well encourage learners to be resources to each other now this ties into the same thing you might not be the smartest person in the room you might not be the uh most experienced person in the room and rightfully so as a facilitator your job is merely to facilitate that existing knowledge that is already existent within this room for example many of you have conducted sessions before and you might have a lot more to add to what i'm saying and you know as a group we should be completely open to that so again i'm uh, i'm reminding you if you do have something to add please do because this will only add to our collective growth as a group yeah um it gives learners the control now this is a a second level skill i might say now in my experience sometimes i come prepared for a certain session and but the group really needs to address something else that has an entire group is very critical to them now like uh shalu said if you done your homework and the group kind of changes the course of the session sometimes when you feel and this is completely up to your discrimination that it is important for them to address that topic instead you can actually follow uh the group and give the group control instead 
But again, you need to be prepared uh, so that you have experience and you have the knowledge to steer them in the right direction. Be extra prepared, yeah, be always extra prepared, and we will talk about how you prepare yourselves uh, in the later slides. Constantly look out for material. Now, every single thing that we look at, every single thing that we experience can be uh, materials that you store in order to use for facilitation. So, uh, and those of you who are teachers in this group or SSE coordinators in this group, you will know this for sure. When you watch a movie, you'd be wondering, how can I use this movie to facilitate my next session? Or when you come across a comic strip, you will think about how do you use this, you know, to actually, um, to actually do your session. So every, every single thing is critically important um, for, for us to look at and kind of store to use for material. And I can see Saigir there saying something. Very important ingredient, before you start the session, pray to Swami to speak through all the participants and oneself to help us evolve in better understanding. I, it, that's my very last point, Swami. Uh, Swami. See, Gide, I'm calling you Swami also now, which is true. So, Swami, that is my very last point as well. Allow for Swami to work, to work through you. And this is an amazing experience, and this is really the reason why I enjoy facilitating because sometimes when you're in a session, right, um, and you're saying something, for me, I know that it is not me because I'd be saying something that I've never said before or thoughts that have never crossed my mind but contribute immensely to the session just comes out of my mouth. And at that point, right, it becomes extremely clear to me that it is not me who is speaking and it is only Swami that is speaking. And just looking at that from a third party perspective and experiencing that is the most amazing feeling. For one, it gives you immense confidence that Swami is right there with you and He's got your back constantly. And secondly, it also, it's such an amazing feeling to directly feel that you're an instrument to Swami. So thank you, Gidi, for um, for you know um, saying that uh, because that is essentially the most important ingredient, uh, which is why I put it at the end. Now let's just go one up. Uh, create your facilitation virtual wardrobe. Now this is just a suggestion, and um, I do it as well. I have a whole section in my computer dedicated to material that I find interesting that I keep in separate folders that can be used in any facilitation sessions. Uh, I will bring up a couple of them uh, throughout the session later, and you can just see them as examples. Now, anything else that you guys feel um, that needs to be part of our ingredient list to form a very good facilitator? Does anyone else have any other uh, thing that we have not covered? I didn't see this earlier, but Prakriti said, sometimes when you do not have an answer to a challenge post, Swami usually makes one of the participants have a better answer than you would have said. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly what I was saying, Prakriti. And at that point, right, you feel like, wow, thank you, Swami, for saving me. And he does that all the time. Uh, Navita says, be patient, accept feedback, whether good or bad. Yep. And you know, this is exactly how you grow as a person, using facilitation as a tool. Uh, a lot of times when we are not able to receive negative feedback, right, you would see, you, you'd see your ego just come and show its face to you because you feel completely challenged, your ego is completely challenged as a facilitator and, you know, all those, those things that are shown to you, that is mirrored to you, gives you an opportunity to grow it shows you exactly where you are and how much of work you have to do on yourself as a person. And so this is exactly uh, an amazing opportunity for you to use as a tool for your growth spiritually as well. Thank you, Navita. Anybody else before I move forward? Great. So let's go to the next slide. We're going to start uh, with a game, right? I want to play a game with you guys. I want you to look at this picture and tell me what you see. So you see this picture, right? Tell me what you see in this picture. You can type your answers in the chat box. 
Sai Lakshmi sees a baby. Interesting. Satya wants a self-introspection, a loving couple, a baby. Where are you guys seeing this baby? A baby and a couple facing the river. Where's the baby? A couple watching sunset by the bridge, a seaside, enjoying nature, looking out the horizon. Many people are seeing babies. Pumaneshwari sees a baby and she's winking. What is this? You got x-ray eyes, is it? Trees and the seaside. Kavita says nature. The branches shape the baby. Wow. A couple looking at the water. Baby in a tree, Divya. <laughs> Alright. A couple standing near the river. Tree, a couple, a sea, fog. Irina, you can see fog. You have amazing eyesight. Baby in the branches. Couple standing by the river, the form of a baby. Couple seeking peace through nature. I mean, wow, wow. <laughs> sea, tree, couple, a romantic couple. Wow, okay. You guys can really see that that is a man and woman now. Wow, okay. Any, and see, of course, uh, the cup, okay, heart, nature, tree, sunset. Could be sunrise also, right, Visha? A tree that's being cut. Hmm. All right. Thank you. Great feedback, everybody. Now, very nice. How many of you have seen this picture for the first time? Just put the answer. Yes, me. Uh, yeah, you can say me. How many of you seeing this picture for the first time? First time, yeah? How many of you have seen this picture before? If you've seen it before, don't say me because I can't differentiate your answers then. If you've seen it before, just type the word B and 4. Just put B, 4, if you've seen it before. Yeah. Ah, now we know the secret to why you guys found the baby. Cool. So all of you have seen it before, saw the baby, right? Now, those of you who have seen this picture for the first time, Okay, this is my question, my question to you. Did you see the baby immediately? Was it easy to spot the baby? Yeah, those, I'm only asking this question to those of you who saw the baby for the first time. Huh? Was it easy to spot the baby? Yeah, some of you are saying easy, some of you are saying no, some said immediately. Prakriti said yes, it was. Yeah, Brandon says no, I couldn't see it. After reading the comments, right. Now, how many of you, after reading the comments, then only you started to search for the baby? What triggered you to start, to start looking for the baby, really? How many of you had this, huh, baby? Where is this baby? And then you started to look at the picture closely or, you know, yeah, right. We still can't find it, Navita. Okay, so Navita, if you look at the end of the end of the the tree trunk, right? And if you look at the entire picture, you would see the baby kind of, you know, in the the shape of a baby. It's not a literal baby. Yeah. You can see a shape of an infant in the trees. Ah, there you go. Oh wow, I see it. <laughs> Irina still sees a couple in the sea. Okay, can you see it now? You see, it's just a shape. Okay, never mind. Forget the baby for a while. Now, what what triggered you to start looking for the baby? I want you to think about your experience in, in a few minutes ago and tell me what triggered you to start looking for the baby. For those of you who, have, who didn't see the baby at first glance. What was the trigger point? Yeah, the comments, right? Of course, in the beginning, what you really looked for, yeah, others, exactly, others prompting. That, that was really what was, you know, made us think, okay, there is something more to this picture that we're just not, we're just not looking at. And you start to pull back from the situation and look at it from a wider angle, right? Now, why do you think you did not notice this in the beginning? Why do you think you did not notice the baby in the beginning?
those of you who saw the baby at first also think about the first time you saw this picture yeah Shalu says uh, to focus on what you wanted to see yeah for me nature overshadowed it Divya is a lover of nature so it completely overshadowed it Meenakshi says I focused on the foreground looked at the picture just at it is, I wasn't thinking out of the box. Yeah, Karitika and Arun said we were focusing on the smaller details. Tanisha said, yeah, I found the baby very cute. Awesome, Tanisha, good for you. Here, <laughs> uh, yeah, Sai Krishna says, focusing on what lies beyond the sea. Wow, very far-sighted, Sai Krishna. Um, never focus on the whole picture. Focus not detail. You didn't focus detailly, yeah. Raksha says, at first you focus on your first impression and experience and the love for nature. Navita says, I also found the baby. Awesome. Good job, guys. Good. Now, let me ask you your next, the next question, yeah? Now, it is very obvious that when we look at something at first glance, we tend to look at uh, things at a more detailed level. You start looking at, you know, some of you saw the sea, some of you saw nature, some of you saw the couple, some of you saw, you know, the, what was beyond the sea. So we start looking at things that, you know, or we, we really want to see in the beginning. And sometimes when we focus on the small things, we tend not to be able to draw ourselves out. Like what Shalu said, you draw yourself away from the screen and kind of look at the big picture. Now, has this, do we miss out on things like this in our everyday life? For example, you miss out on the big picture because you're completely focused on the small things. Has that ever happened to you? Sometimes, yeah. So I've got a couple of yeses, a couple of sometimes. Now, let's think about this. What is the consequence of missing out on the big picture? What do you feel the consequences are of missing out on the big picture? What, what, what happens to us? What, what would we go through? Any sort of experience that you want to share? Divya says, uh, Kavita says, yeah, missing out on opportunities sometimes. Divya says, we miss out on the learning sometimes that could be really life-changing. Yes, um, a misunderstanding tends to arise, says Indu. Um, missing the message or the lesson, yeah. Shalu says, you have too much of attachment. Prakriti says, you do not make the links that could have potentially you could have potentially had. Yeah, you don't connect the dots, right? Vaishnavi says, we forget what is important. Michelle says, you miss out on the essence of something. Yes, very true, Michelle. Prema says, miss out on important things. Yakshi says, we tend to not focus on what's going right. Yeah, we focus on, you know, what's troubling us, what's difficult. Raksha says, I trust that if one person is open to listening among all, we'll create that big picture. That's very true. Uh, Visha says, you do not move forward. You stay stuck somehow. Thank you so much, guys. These are really, these are really good thoughts. Uh, Satya says, we do not open our mind. Yep. All right. Now, having this in mind, what do you think we should do to kind of, you know, um, try to look at the big picture more often? What can we do to increase our sense of awareness and expand our thinking? Again, you may put your answers. Yeah, Gidi says, uh, sorry, Tiger just says, you, step, you can step back. Yeah, look at things by looking, taking yourself out of the situation, I guess. Brandon says, more knowledge and wisdom from experience. Yep. Divya says, be open-minded and not judgmental. Yes, that's true. Try to, re try to see that there is a reason behind everything. Stand out and think that why things may have happened. Step back and give it time. Slow down a little. Suspend our emotions, as I'm uh, Meditation, silence, yeah, we can use that. That gives us a lot of sense of awareness to tend to increase. Raksha says, be empathetic, listening, humility, always ask for feedback. Umesh says, have more attention to detail. Kavita says, be in others' shoes. 
be empathetic and sympathetic. Slow down, meditation really helps. Start from the beginning from a different view, yep. Having the ability to change your perspective is also important. Yeah, thank you everybody. This is this is really good stuff. Thank you so much for sharing, you know, um your thoughts. Now, Swami also talks about this, and one of my most favorite stories that really illustrates this point uh, was a story that was shared to us by Brother Satyajit uh, on one of his experiences that um, he had with Swami while he was traveling with Swami in the car one day. And I, I'm sure you've got, you guys have heard this story, but it is a very, very impactful story for me. So Satyajit told us that, you know, as he was in the car with Swami, Swami had asked him, you know, tell me, what do you want to see? Do you want to see Krishna? Do you want to see Rama? Do you want to see uh, uh, Shirdi Sai Baba? Just tell me and I will show it to you. And of course, Brother Satyajit says, no, Swami, I, 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 I only want to see you. I don't have any desire to see anyone else. And, uh, of course, Swami persists and Swami says, no, nothing doing. Tell me anything. I will show you whatever you want to see. So this is really uh, humorous. So Brother Satyajit tells us that, you know, in order to be non-biased and in order to know that not get myself in trouble by just picking one form, I tell Swami, you know what, Swami? I want to see your Vishwarupa, meaning I want to see your all-encompassing form. Swami looks at uh, Brother Satyajit and then he looks out of the window and then he says, you're looking at that every single day. And then he says, and then it hits me that every single part of nature, every single part of creation is really Swami. Everything, every being, every part of him is what we see every single day. But not looking at that big picture, not having that understanding, we isolate ourselves to that you know, small life that we lead. And we don't have faith. You know, Swami also says that when you look at life, it's like a parade. And you're standing in the midst of that parade and you're watching that parade go. But my vision is the beginning of the parade, the middle of the parade where you're standing, and also the end of the parade. And so I can see the entire spectrum. And for me, everything is perfect as is. But for you, because you're only seeing that part that you're experiencing right now, you tend to be frustrated because you don't have the vision of the bigger picture. And when you don't have that vision, all you need to do is to trust and have faith in me because I have that bigger picture and I have that vision. Now, I want you to tell me, what were certain insights that you gained through this activity that we just did? What occurred to you? What was your learning through this activity? And if you could just put that in the chat box. Savita says to be open, to be observant. Ram says to have faith and be patient for the bigger picture. Yep, have faith to broaden our horizons. No hurry and make any conclusions only within time. This is Anastasia. Nice. Anybody else? A timely reminder to have faith in Swami. We cannot see the bigger picture, but we allow him and his plan to unfold. Thank you, Prakriti. Anyone else? Kartika and Arun says be patient. Give some time and have faith. All right, thank you, everybody. Be patient and wait. Change your mind. Sometimes try looking at your life from a different horizon. Nice, Sai Krishna. Irina says you feel joy, and that was your insight. Brilliant. Be open-minded and try to understand others in their shoes. Be open-minded. Okay. Now, my final question for you guys in this activity is, what would you take from here to practice in your everyday life, if that is different from the insight that you got. How would you practice this every day? Now you have this learning, you have this insight, how will you put it to practice? Any thoughts? How would you turn this into practical application? 
Brandon says constant integrated awareness. Yeah, that's exactly what Swami says as well. CIA. Shalu says step, step back, engage situations. Yeah, don't be caught up in the situation. Tiger there says watch. Tiger uh, there, you wanna you want to expand on that? Watch your. I'll allow you to type it out. Navita says don't rush to make decisions. Yeah. Observe first. Try to uh, try from simple things, says Satya. Yeah, so that's the expansion of the word watch, everybody. It's a very beautiful acronym as well. Watch your words, actions, thoughts, character, and heart. Observe before responding. To see one in all us an amazing learning. To know and feel that we are all Swami. Everything is Swami. Irina says to not be so detailed. Step back and watch with joy. Look, Satya says, look more than once and be amazed at the surprises of life. This is amazing. Divya says, not let emotions take control. Step back and analyze the situation. Amazing, guys. Now, this is the moment of truth. I'm going to reveal to you uh, the questions that I used throughout the session. Now, this was a live session that we connect, uh, conducted just now. And I want you to kind of uh, step back, which we, what is what we learned. Step back and kind of press the rewind button and play it, play this entire experience and watch it now from a third party perspective, okay? So I'm going to show you, these are the questions that I've actually asked you. Pay attention to the color, yeah? So if you look at the blue questions, you can see that those questions that I asked you was, was it easy or difficult to spot the baby? Uh, what were the things that first caught your eye? What triggered you to start looking for the baby? Why do you think you did not notice this in the beginning? These are all blue, huh? and there's a reason why I color-coded these questions. Just want you to observe it first. Uh, the green questions are, we, do we miss out on things like this in our everyday life? What are the consequences of missing out on the big picture? How do we increase our sense of awareness and expand our thinking? Uh, and then the, the red statements are story of Swami and Vishwarupa that I told you guys. I, I also added another one just now, the the one about Swami having a wide range of perspectives, yeah? Uh, that just came to me, so I, I just threw it in. It wasn't something I planned. Uh, tell us about your personal insights from this activity. Those are red. And the ones in orange, uh, how would you put this knowledge into action in your own life? Now, I want you to look at these questions and tell me why did I color code it differently? Just, just think about it. Any, any answer is the correct answer. Uh, any, any of your thoughts contribute to our growth together. I'm constantly reminding you about this. Just guess why have I color coded the questions differently? Mm -hmm. Vaishnavi says the blue questions are all observation from the picture. That's true. Spot on. Anybody else? The blue are all the details. I like, I like you, Kavita. <laughs> Colors of the rainbow, meaning everything ties together. <laughs> Very divergent thinker you are. Shalu says blue are individual-based questions. Uh, the red were obviously very important part of it. Sivya says I categorized them into what we observed, what we missed, what we learned, and how to use it. Navita says you think that each color is for each stage. Yes, yes, you guys are warm. That is true. Uh, Raksha says the orange is the practical expect, the red is personal experience, right? Yeah. <laughs> Satya says depth of learning, Minakshi says different colors, different categories of question maybe? Minakshi, you are right. Prema says to give categories, yes Prema, that's true. Prema, you need to change your settings, everyone can't see you, only I can see you. So change it uh, in the chat box to everyone instead of me privately. Uh, Shalu says, orange is a takeaway message. Anastasia says, there are, there are stages. Subject matter, conclusion, and takeaway message. So, it's obvious to everybody that I've got some sort of stages going on here, right? Now, before we move into the technicalities of developing these stages, I want to tell you about Swami, who was also a wonderful uh, facilitator. So, there is this there is this uh, beautiful story of how Swami used to facilitate sessions as well. So Swami used to sit, take everybody to Chitravati River. 
and he used to sit in the Chitravati sand and he would draw a circle around him in a distance. And then he would sing a bhajan and at the same time, a can or a coconut shell with chits, with values and negative emotions on it, or written on it, would be handed out to the people in the circle. Now, the kids or the devotees who were seated around the circle uh, would pass it to each of and every one of them, basically like passing the parcel. And Swami would sing a bhajan. Whenever he stopped the bhajan, someone would take the shell and pick out a chit from it. If love or truth or any other values come out, that person that picked a positive value would get to sit in the circle with Swami. If they got a negative emotion, they would continue the playing the game uh, and, the, and the game would go on uh, while they are sitting away from Swami. Now, of course, I'm sure all of you would know what is the debrief from this session, right? So, um, Swami also, you know, uh, conducted facilitation session. Can you guess what the debrief of the session was? So because we have a very short short amount of time uh, left, I'm going to kind of tell you what the values that Swami was trying to bring forth were. So the debrief was that practical human values really take you closer to Swami. And whenever you have negative emotions, you continue to be in the circle of life and you continue to play the game. But as soon as you start to develop good values, you become closer and closer to Swami. So what I'm trying to bring out here is that the activity that you conduct should not be what is critical, but really the questioning skills and the debrief is what takes center stage whenever you are facilitating a session. Now, what we can also do is to use any sort of Swami's five teaching techniques to actually facilitate a session. So what we did just now was really play a game. We did an activity. In the same way, you can also use music as a way to actually, you know, uh, engage participants in the beginning. You can use prayer. We did that in the beginning as well. You can also use a story. And of course, silent sitting is another methodology to actually uh, facilitate a session or to actually trigger a session that is you're going to facilitate. Now, let's go into the technical part of things. So using this uh, quotation from Swami, you see this is, Swami actually spoke about this in Satisai Speak. Swami says that there are a few steps between superficial knowledge and practical knowledge. From superficial knowledge, we must go and we must proceed to general knowledge. After analyzing this general knowledge, one gains discrimination knowledge and knows the difference between good and evil. Right? So basically what we want to achieve is move to move from superficial knowledge to practical knowledge. Yeah? So again, in the beginning, we remember what Swami said, true knowledge is something that we are able to practice. Now again, you can see the color codes in this quotation as well. And this is what directly uh, translates into the type of questions that we are asking. Yeah? You can see the colors here also, right? So I'm going to take you through the type of questions that we are developing. So all the blue questions that you observed just now is what we call superficial knowledge, or basically things that are very obvious, things that you can actually see. Now here, we ask questions about the actual activity that is being done. Uh, so we focus on... Sorry. Uh, someone's mic is not muted. Yeah, okay. You focus on the preliminary feelings and talk about your observations during the game, activity, song, or even as you are reading out a quotation, you know, the feelings that you felt. What did you feel when you read this quotation? What did you feel when you listened to the story? So they are very focused on the actual activity that is being done. Yeah. Here also, something to really remember, especially when you're conducting live sessions where you are there, as a facilitator, you need to be very observant about what people are going through. So facial reactions, uh, the way people responded to each other as the activity was going on, uh, behaviors of groups, uh, behaviors of people during the activity. Uh, you know, every single thing can be a point of reflection. And as a facilitator, here's where you look out for them, right? 
Now, level two questions are very general knowledge base. Now, these are things that we want to relate to in everyday life. So here, we start asking questions that relate to activity on a larger scale of things. For example, you base those questions on real life situations. Like just now I asked you, in life, do you miss out on seeing out seeing the big picture, right? Those were one of the questions. How can we relate this to everyday situations? Speak about your experiences around this area and encourage participants to share their experience as well. So these are the green questions, the level two questions, yeah? Now, level three is when we come to discrimination knowledge or what I call anchoring. Here's where you ask questions or you relate stories or advice or you relate it and anchor it back to Swami's message, Swami's story and experience of Swami. And of course, if you're not doing this in a Thai environment, you can always link it back to very strong personal experiences. You can link it back to... Uh, saying of sayings and quotations from great leaders, yeah? So here's where the anchoring happens. And we really, really look at what is right, what is wrong, what are we choosing to practice from this entire ex uh, experience and really applying our discrimination. Finally, we go to level four, which is implementation of the learning. Now here's where we reach practical knowledge. Up till this point, we have touched Physical level, meaning what is really happening. We've discriminated about it using our mental capability. We looked at how we feel about things. Yeah, We anchored it towards something that we feel very strongly about. So we've also touched the heart. We've touched the hands. We've touched the head. And we've touched the heart. And finally, at level four, we want to convert this into something that is practical. So here's where you ask level four questions, which are questions on how action will be taken or how practical is this knowledge to be practiced in every single day or uh, in their daily life, right? I'm going to stop and pause here for a moment and ask you guys if you have any questions at all at this point. I see some of you have uh, also given more thought to why the earlier question, and sorry I didn't read that out. Yeah? Sometimes, again, if you have any questions at this point, because this is really something that is important. So if you have any questions here, please ask them. You don't have to wait till the end. All right. I guess everybody understands. Ah, Kunal has a good question. Do we always have to follow this order, sister? Yeah, there is a reason, Kunal, why we are following this order. You see, um, when you start a discussion, if you ask, and this is just normal human behavior, right? If you ask questions that are too complex or too deep in the beginning of a session, right? People will tend to be a bit apprehensive about giving their thoughts. So this process kind of warms them up towards um, thinking on a deeper level. So you look at level one questions. They're questions that are very easy to answer. So it's easy for people to answer. Now, what you're doing is you're kind of jogging them along the process. And as you answer, if you look at it, it goes deeper. It opens up deeper thought as the process, uh, as the, the questions progress. So that's the reason why we follow this order. Now, situations where you don't have to follow the order, it's like, for example, you've already been uh, in a satsang for a really long time. Yeah and um, people are already comfortable with each other, people know each other really well. Here you can open up, right, you can start off in immediately with level two or level three questions, or in fact, you can go right to level four questions, and I'll give you an example of that uh, two, two slides from now, yeah? Kartika and Arun, yeah, sure, definitely. That I would definitely be able to do that. I'll let you all know later, yeah, how, how you can get hold of it. Right, so I hope that answers your question, Kunal. Is, is that all right? You can um, let me know yeah, if you need further clarification. So I'm going to move on, uh, hoping that all of you know this, because the next thing that we're going to do is I'm going to tell you a story, and after the story, I am going to um, ask you to create the questions. Yeah. So very quickly, I'm going to 
run through this story and then this is a story from Swami, it's a Chinnakata. So listen very carefully to the story, okay? There once lived in the state of Karnataka a pious Brahmin who was a great scholar. He had an equally devout wife. Always intent on worship, recitation and meditation, this noble man was known far and wide for his virtuous character. One day, a sannyasi or a renunciant came to his door seeking for arms. Okay, he was looking for arms. Um, this made the Brahmin extremely happy. After giving him whatever he could that day, he invited the monk the next day to come and have dinner with him as, and because he was on, uh, keen to honor the ascetic with due respect and hospital, hospitality. So the next morning, he made elaborate uh, arrangements, but at the 11th hour, his wife fell ill and was unfit to prepare food for the guest. Luckily for him, at this moment, his neighbor came to the rescue, and she volunteered to cook the meal. And so she was brought to the kitchen, everything went off well, and the saint came, and he was greeted respectfully, and the meal was placed in front of him. Now, something peculiar really happened at that point of time. During the meal, the saint had a incredible desire to steal a silver cup that was placed in front of him by his host. And he just could not overcome that desire. And towards the end of the, the lunch, he took the silver cup, put it between the folds of his clothes, and he left. Now at night, when the saint fell asleep, he was incredibly disturbed because he didn't see how this could happen to him. He wondered how he could have betrayed all his learnings, all his gurus and the mantras that he recited every day and stooped to this level of stealing a vessel. The very next morning, he walked directly to the house of his host, fell at his feet with tears in his eyes, and he begged for forgiveness. Now, the saint was really, really curious as to why this thought kind of overcame him. Why could he not, why could he, you know, how in the world could he have become a thief? Now, as he examined this, he started to realize um, that this was exactly, this was the, the reason why he, this had thought had occurred to him was because the person that had cooked the food, the neighbor who had actually come to the rescue, was a thief. And she was an incurable thief. And because she had prepared the food, that subtle contact had affected the food that she prepared. And this is the reason really why spiritual aspirants are advised to live only on fruit and tubers or when they reach a certain stage of their spiritual achievement because their mind absorbs things like this so so um, easily. And so, you know, this is a story that Swami had told before. Now, using this story, what I want all of you to do is, I want you to try and create questions. Yeah. So using the story as a base, what do you think your level one question would be? Anyone can just type in the text chat box really quickly. All right, so we've got responses coming in. Why do you think the sage stole the cup? Yep. Why didn't the Brahmin cook for himself, right? Uh huh. Um, how can a person overcome desire? Right? Uh, you didn't hear the question just now. Can I repeat? Yeah. So based on the story, right? So initially, what kind of questions can you create? Kunal says, what you see in the picture. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. So you went right to basics. Anyone else? What are level one? So level one questions, remember, they are things that you observe, things that you could find in the story. What do you understand from the story? Okay, so we've got really good questions coming up. What was the lady thinking when she was cooking? Right. What do you see in picture? What do you understand from the story? What is the value in the story? Why is even the stage so affected by the pots put into food cooking process? Nice. All right. 
So I'm going to go ahead and show you a couple of questions that, um, that I thought about in level one. Okay, so you look at level one questions. They are very, it doesn't have to be really long, yeah? Okay, so look at the level one questions. Did you enjoy the story? Was the ideas in the story practical? So here I'm challenging the understanding of the participants, yeah? So you're looking at level one questions. Some of you have given great questions, but they don't really fit into level one. So if you look at this, you look at level two questions. So level two questions, you can see, um, have you had any personal experience such as this, with, like this food story? Yeah. Do you think that it's true that food influences the way that we think and act? How can you be sure of purity of your food? So if you look at the level two questions, again, they are very, very practical. What steps can we take to ensure we eat pure food? Again, such a very practical uh, answer, question. So level three, you can ask questions that again are anchoring. What else does Swami say about the purity of the food that we partake of? Any incidents or stories or quotes that, that you can relate to? So of course here, I'm, I'm sure the primary thing that appears to everybody is the power of Brahmarpanam. Uh, you can talk about, you know, how Swami says that we need to be careful about the source of our food, uh, the vessels that we cook our food in, and how this affects the purity of our food, the people that actually call, uh, cooks the food, how all this correlates. Basically what Brother Saigirdar is uh, saying right here. Yeah, so all these insights, you can ask questions like this to generate thoughts in level three. Yeah, and finally, in level four, how do you put this into practice? So what I'm trying to do here, guys, uh, and because we don't have time, I can't get you, wait for everybody to generate the questions, but I hope you can see the kind of questions that fit into the different levels. Now, if you look at this, some of you have had given questions like, what do you understand from this story? Now, that would be uh, a too wide a question, too open a question, so you're not really facilitating the knowledge, you're just leaving it open and asking a you know, a complete open-ended question. Again, if the group is really uh, mature and the group is already comfortable with each other, you might get amazing insights. But if you have a group of people who are not very um, used to this kind of knowledge, they might not be so open about their thoughts or they might need a little bit more guidance to produce their thoughts. Yeah, so uh, a couple of questions that came about were amazing. They did fit into level one, but some of the other questions need to be fitted accordingly uh, throughout the stages of your facilitation, right? Now let's move on. Other facilitation tools that you can use. Now, of course, questioning skills and this level one to level four questions is one type of facilitation. Normally, you can use it for groups of maximum about 20 people so that their thoughts can be heard. Yeah, I'm only doing this today here in this group of a large number of people because they're learning facilitation skills. However, in a bigger bunch of people, a bigger group, so what we normally do is group discussions. Uh, we can use pictorial reviews, or you can even use physical items to review your learning. So let me just explain these three techniques to you. So the first one we're gonna look at is, I'm gonna skip this song. Yeah, is using pictorial review. So what really is pictorial review? To have a collection of pictures given to a group or individual and to ask them to kind of explain their learning through those pictures. Or, for example, let the individuals express their insights using the pictures. So let's just do a quick example here. Now remember the story that I taught you, uh, that I told you just now? Looking at these objects and these pictures, Pick one picture that would best describe your learning from the story and tell me what did you, how can you use it. So any of the pictures here and how those pictures can describe your learning. So you can say, for example, um, I picked the picture of the flowers because the, the flowers shows the variety of things that get inputted uh, to our system through our different senses and how we must be aware of everything that comes to us through our five senses. Yeah, so Ram says a picture of cookie and ice cookies and ice cream and how would you relate that to the story? 
Yes, Anastasia says, I pick the stones because I can see reason and consequence described by the picture. Yeah, so the stones kind of show a reason and consequence. So whatever we go through, whatever we do, there is a consequence to it. And that's exactly what I'm looking for. Anyone else? Any of the picture describes what you learned from the story? Picture of traffic signals, stay, watch, and then watch out and proceed. Yep. So, you know, stop, be aware of your surroundings and what you're putting into your system and then proceed. The traffic lights, first stop and check what we're taking in. Thread carefully in picking the sensory inputs. Once you're sure and good, go ahead. Yeah. Nice. So I think you guys kind of get the idea, right? Yeah, the traffic light seems to be a popular option. Yeah, new stepping stones as questions to facilitate your way through the presentation. Aditya is summarizing the session already. Don't be a bull and focus only on the red flag. Amazing. The ice cream, be sweet, cooling and calming and satisfying. Okay. Nice. All right, so you guys get the idea. Sometimes using objects and pictures, right, kind of diverts the way we facilitate, kind of throws everyone um, out of the normal way of facilitating and, you know, kind of has an effect on the way that we facilitate. Another thing you could do is, uh, I like to do this also, have physical objects and get people to build something that represents their learning. So if I actually gave you a couple of stones, a flower, five twigs, uh, maybe two empty water bottles, what could you build with those items to represent what you've learned? Uh, again, you can use Lego, you can use um, um, molding plaster, uh, plaster scene, you know, Play-Doh, any sort of item that, you know, you could use to build something to represent your learning. Uh, and this kind of throws people's mindset off and, you know, breaks the normal way of facilitation and kind of gives you a lot of new ideas. Uh, this methodology is is called forced attributes. And those of you who were there during the 2016 SSILT, I did this with you guys. So that, that was an example of what I did using objects. Remember, we used Swami's umbrella and we used the lamp as a way to uh, have divergent thoughts. So this is facilitation using objects. Guided group questions. This is when you have huge groups and you want to uh, break them into groups and ask them to discuss something, never use more than three to five questions because that uh, people get lost in too much of thought and it will take too much of time for them to discuss later. So guided group questions could be questions like, what did you like about the story? What did you learn? Um, and what, do you, what could we do to encourage? Uh, this was based on the video that I wanted to play, but what could you do to encourage more creation of such videos? So simple questions like this uh, aids discussion in a group when you're facilitating large groups. Yeah. Finally, we've come to facilitating online sessions. Now, these are just suggestions, but here's where I want to see how much of attention you guys have been paying to the way that I facilitated this entire online session. Now tell me, again, press the stall button, rewind and play again, and tell me what did you observe and what learnings have you gained from observing me uh, facilitating this session online? What were specific things that I did? Now I want you to think about it from the from right from the beginning. Even before I said Sairam, what did I do on the chat box? What did I do when I started the session? Just Play that entire thing again and observe what I did and tell me what you learned. Yeah, so go ahead, guys, think about it and put your answers in the chat box. This will be the last question. So I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think about this because it's a whole one and a half hour experience. So just point out things that you observed that I did while I facilitated the session online and see whether you can, let's, let's see what you caught. So Minakshi says, I encouraged everyone to interact actively throughout the session, yeah? How did I do that though, Minakshi? I want very specific things, because here we are really talking about facilitating online sessions. Thank you, Vaishnavi, you said collaborative learning. But let's think step by step. Now, what did I do when I first started, even before Donovan intro introduced me? 
Thank you very much, Raksha. Uh, make people feel welcome, interactive questions, appreciate their contribution and feedback. I did that throughout. Uh, okay, voice was enthusiastic. I introduced the session, clearly established what I expected from the audience. Yes, you good, you picked up on that. I encourage participation, I ask the right questions. Yeah, thank you. Arousing curiosity, yes, good observation. I made everyone feel uh, part of the session by naming each person. Yes, I use your names a lot. That is also very good as a uh, good observation. Uh, Satya says, we played music. Yeah, we did that to give it a good atmosphere. So that was a good observation as well. Yeah, I asked questions so everyone can participate. I told stories, correct? Yeah, so good, nice. So these were the these were the things that you guys observed. I introduced the session clearly. Yeah, first of all, I made sure if everyone was listening, whether my voice was clear or not. I asked if everyone was involved with yes and no answers. Very good, Nichelle. That's very good observation. Um, so that's very important. So I'm going to just run through very quickly what I did. And I'm sure many of you have observed this at all, uh, also, yeah. So, um, but I'm going to just highlight it. So, if you notice, my first two questions for you guys were: uh, Have you ever conducted a facilitated a session before? Now, this was a very easy question to answer. It was basically a yes or no question. Yeah. So I got you to start participating by asking you extremely simple questions. Now, this is exactly what level one questions are, right? You want to make people feel uh, welcome. You want to make people feel that they're not judged. So you start off by asking really easy questions so people kind of get involved. Now, of course, in a live session, you're able to see people being involved. You get to see body language. But on an online session, you can't really see that. And therefore, the simple yes and no questions is very important, yeah? Then the next question was to gain uh, buy-in from all of you by making sure that everyone would commit to participating. And again, that was a simple yes and no question. Now, you can even do this before the session gets started. So one of the techniques that I always use or one of the things I like to do is join the session early and try and chat with the participants before the session begins. Now, this works two ways, right? Even in, an, in a, a, a real session, not an online session, it kind of establishes contact between you and the participants, and it reduces nervousness for me, and that, that, that really helps me because I feel like I'm just speaking to my brothers and sisters, so I tend to be less nervous. Uh, and also, it makes the participants be very um, comfortable in the situation. So, you know, so that's one thing that is very critical for us to do. Now, another thing is to constantly use the chat box um, to engage your participants. A lot of you actually said that, yeah? And acknowledge every answer and sound positive in receiving the same. Uh, Sagirita said that. It's, it's true. There is no such thing as a right answer and a wrong answer, and you need to, like, imprint that in your mind, except, and I will have to say this, when someone is saying something that is completely untrue and is completely misguided, then we need to have a way to correct them. And sometimes what you want to do is uh, correct them privately. And of course, in online sessions, you can do that as well. You can privately message the person. And you can correct it in a non-threatening manner online. So these are certain things that you can do online. Of course, I didn't use this. You can always use polls to ask questions. A lot of the uh, WebEx and webinar tools have this capability. If you have really small groups, allow them to unmute and share experiences and ask questions. Yeah, um, It's a lot more participative when people get to speak instead of chat. Yeah, uh, You can use videos. We wanted to do that today, but we ran out of time for better impact in telling stories. Uh, you can use music. To set the environment, I love the YATD team. They always have really amazing music when they start their yeah, sessions. Yeah, and that kind of sets the mood and the environment um, for for the sessions. Also, if you guys, those of you who 
R&D at this ILP session, you notice we start off with videos that kind of consolidates everyone's thoughts to focus on Swami. Another thing that I did when I started was, and this is something I always do that helps me and to run sessions better, is to always focus my thoughts and the thoughts of the participants on Swami before we begin. Uh, that really calms me down and, and, you know, kind of allows me to get into things without fear. So mostly I do it for me, but it seems to work for everyone else as well. So here, these are, these are a couple of things that I feel we can do on online sessions to make them more interactive. And of course, my most important principle that I always go back to is to always be real. Uh, when we run sessions, people should not feel that, you know, this whole I am better than you, I am holier than you, I am more experienced than you. It, when you have that kind of persona, it kind of stops people from wanting to share out of fear of being judged. But when you constantly reassure the participants that, you know what, I'm a YA just like you, I have insecurities just like you, let's learn together, that kind of opens up the floor to a lot better sharing. So that leads us to the last part, which is um, questions and answers. Yeah. And these are sub a couple of questions that I have to leave you with. What should we do next? Uh, how would we practice this knowledge? So if there are really pressing questions, I would encourage you to ask them now. But I would also let you know that, that um, if any of you want to conduct a facilitation session that honestly normally takes two days to run, um, and it is extremely condensed into this one and a half hours, so I'm really just barely touching the... The, the surface of facilitation techniques. And if you want to run this for your team, you know, I know some of the subcommittees want to run this or some of the countries want to run this, you can always get in touch with me and we can arrange for that. So let's get the questions going. Sorry, guys. As I said, Christian, I would, I would like to know how to engage with people who are in the same group of, who are in the same group of participants. Ah, very good question, Anastasia. Now, this is, an, um, this is a huge challenge. So her question is, how would I engage people who are in the same group of participants but are very different age categories? Yes, this is indeed a challenge. Now, most of the time, we try our best to not do this. But if you are put in a situation, then you start off the session by, by you know, having a disclaimer saying that, okay, we are in a session where uh, we obviously have very different age groups of people. So you, you really ask questions that are generic, that would apply to both age groups, and somehow facilitating that knowledge for different groups as well. Now, I'll use Swami's example of when he, that game that I was telling you about that he played in Chitravati, right? So for a group of children, Swami's debrief would be very simple. His debrief is, do good, you will be with Swami. If you are naughty and you are practicing bad values, you will continue to play the game and you will be away from Swami. And that is all the degree would be. But if he is doing this with a group of adults, and I've heard this from some other, uh, other people, is Swami would actually tell them that the more good values you practice, you will then merge with Swami. But if you are constantly practicing are negative values, you continue in the game of life and you continue in this cycle of birth and death. Now that one activity, the debrief becomes two very different things. And if time allows, you can actually do two debriefs for your sessions. But if time doesn't allow, stick to the basic one that applies to both, uh, both age groups. Okay, I hope I answered your question. Anastasia, you can you can PM me on Skype later and we can continue this discussion. So if there are no other questions, I am going to um, end here. Savita has, says, has one more question. Last one, guys. Everything else we can discuss later. Um, what should we do in a situation when participants repeatedly ask the same question? Ha, ah, very good questions, Kavita. Now, you answer the question and maybe during the break, you tell the participant, like what I'm doing right now, right? I'm running out of time. So I just be real, apologize. Like, I'm sorry, Kavita. Uh, what I'm going to do is maybe later you can 
um, text me and we can discuss this offline because I really need to continue with the session. So simple as that, I find being telling the truth, not really putting on a show is very important. So if you've explained it, if the rest of the group already understands, then it's important that you don't just focus on one person. That sometimes is something that we tend to get carried away with. Um, I really hope I can do another session with you guys because there's so much more to discuss. Uh, like how do you handle difficult participants and stuff like that. And um, I hope that we would be able to meet again for another session soon. Having said that, I would now pass the mic back to uh, Donovan, Abina, and team. Um, and thank you very much, everyone, for being incredibly participative. I uh, loved every single thing that you guys said. And I hope to see you guys again. Don't forget to sign up for the next YAPD session, which would also be very interesting. Thank you so much, everybody. And um, Abina, Donovan, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Roshni, for sharing with us the techniques of bringing groups together to grow and learn. I'm sure all of us have learned something from this session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And let's close today's session with prayer. Om. 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 Shanti. 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 Jai Sai Ram, everyone.